Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old-time religion setting forth his sovereignty and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious Word of Sovereign Grace. Here's this week's message. Uh, 
Uh, and man has ever been trying to build a case for their own righteousness and, and sew together their own works uh, to put before them. Uh, the Pharisees, again, uh, to me, I believe they embody the very people that are being purged out of this kingdom uh, and being purged away from uh, the kingdom of Almighty God. We see uh, their attitude whenever we uh, look at uh, Luke chapter 18. It says that there's two men that went to pray. Uh, one was a Pharisee and the other a publican. And the, it said the Pharisee, first of all, uh, his position was that he stood. Uh, we, we've heard this morning about those that are at the very feet of Jesus, and you can't stand and be at the feet of Jesus. You have to be kneeling and uh, be prostrate, uh, <coughs> prostrate before him. Uh, you have to fall down uh, at his feet in order to, to, to live there. Uh, but here this Pharisee, uh, he was standing. He, was, he stood, and it says uh, this, he prayed thus with himself. Uh, he was not really interested in... Uh, praying to God, he was interested in those around him hearing what it is he had to say. Uh, and in other places, it would correspond and say that uh, they would, pre uh, they would uh, pray with long, repetitious prayers. And I believe over Matthew uh, 6, it talks about them blowing the trumpet before they pray. And they stand on the corners and they want everyone to see them. And the Lord says that they have their reward. Uh, but they do this because of their pride. And they say, uh, Lord, I thank thee that I'm not as other men. And he begins to compare themselves with all these murderers and extortioners. And then he says that uh, uh, this is the thing that I do. I, I, I pay tithes and I fast twice a week. And here's all the things that I do. Uh, the scriptures tell us how they would fast. That when they fast, they would mar their face and want everyone around them to see what it is they were doing. Uh, when a Pharisee fast, uh, you didn't have to wonder what he was doing because of uh, the appearance that he gave was enough to let everyone know that this is what I'm doing. I'm fasting because I'm righteous, you see. Uh, they're lifted up in pride. Uh, very early in Genesis 11, we find uh, folks that wanted to make themselves a name and build a tower that reached into the sky, and uh, the Lord hated it. It was an abomination unto him, and it said that he went down and confounded their language and scattered them uh, abroad, uh, abroad upon the face of the earth. Uh, and by, by the way, one of the um, uh, seven things that the Lord takes over in Proverbs chapter 6, the very first one listed, is a proud look. Uh, and the Bible tells us in many places to humble ourselves uh, and we'll be exalted. And if we exalt ourselves, we're going to be humble. As a matter of fact, a uh, Babylonian king uh, has one of the most outstanding statements in all the Bible uh, whenever he was made to be a beast of the field because of his pride. And he says, look at this great Babylon that I've made, and look at all this that I've done by the power of my might and by the majesty of my glory. And he said at that very instant, he was struck down. And uh, of course, the prophecy said that he would be struck down. And at the end of that time, it said that his understanding came to him. And he declared, he said, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, uh, but he worked his will among the, uh, the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none shall stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? And it says that uh, his reasoning returned unto him, his counsel were sought unto him. And uh, he says, I now, Nebuchadnezzar, I praise and I extol and I honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment and all those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Now here's the thing that makes me uh, very uh, careful and uh, very uh, fearful is uh, not just to the wicked, but to any that would walk in pride, the Lord is able to abase us. Uh, he can keep us out of that kingdom, even if we've met with the kingdom, if you can understand what I'm talking about. Uh, let us not be high-minded uh, and think of ourselves as primitive Baptists more highly than we ought to, but we need to be thankful for the things that we have, lest we be rendered from the kingdom ourselves. Uh, we, we certainly uh, don't have this of our own works or of our own abilities, those Pharisees said, well, I have Abraham as my father. And uh, John the Baptist rebuked them for that and says that the Lord is able to raise up of stones uh, seed unto Abraham. Uh, we find uh, many things concerning those Pharisees. And uh, <clears throat> matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 23, uh, we find this where it's one of the woe, it's, it's kind of that woe chapter where the Lord begins to uh, upbraid them. And he says, woe unto the uh, Pharisees and scribes. And it says, they sit in Moses' seat which tells you right away that they thought they were the pinnacle of the law. They thought they had it all together and that they kept the law. You look at the rich young ruler in talking with the Lord Jesus Christ and asking what good thing he could do to inherit eternal life. Uh, and if he could just listen to his own question, he might have answered it. It's, if it's something you inherit, then it's not something you do to get it. 
Uh, but anyway, he asked a question, and the Lord gave him an answer unlike any we would give him. Yeah. Said, what, uh, you know, keep the commandments. He says, which ones? And the rich young ruler says, I've kept all these. You yeah. see, I'm sitting in Moses' seat. I've kept the law. Even uh, Paul, in describing his pedigree over in uh, Philippians chapter 3, I believe it is, he says, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisee. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrew. And as touching the law, I was blameless. Uh, again, that goes to show their mindset, and ours too, if we're not careful. But uh, in Matthew 23, uh, in 23, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And again, uh, I know that I, I believe this group of folks to be wicked, but uh, it makes me very fearful when I think of myself as possibly being a hypocrite. And I want to be very careful that the things that I say and the things that I uh, proceed out of my mouth is where my feet are found walking. I don't want those uh, in the school in which I teach or the community in which I live to see one person on Sunday and somebody else Monday through Saturday. I want to be found uh, uh, upright and in my integrity, and if they want to accuse me, I trust it'll be false me. Uh, but he says, uh, woe unto them. He calls them hypocrites, for they pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Now, he does not call them hypocrites for doing the one. Uh, he doesn't say that it's wrong to pay the tithe, and I don't want to get into tithing, but I, uh, what we're saying is the things of the law that they were performing was fine, but they have omitted the more important things. And by the way, the things that were more important were a part of the law. They were not against the law. They were not something outside the law, but they were a part of the law. And I believe what the Lord is saying is these are the most important things contained within the law. And the three things that he lists here are judgment, mercy, and faith. Now, judgment, uh, I know that the word here, and I don't know the Greek word. I did look it up. It means the decision or the verdict. In other words, justice. But the very premise of justice is truth. Uh, you don't have justice absent of truth, and I think one of the weightier matters of the law is the truth of the law. And I think it's one thing that we have to be thankful for is that primitive Baptists have true doctrine based up by the Word of God. And uh, I'm going to just say uh, as a way of commendation to the Lord's ministers that I've heard uh, most of my life uh, is that when they uh, preach the gospel, they back it up with scriptures. They're not up here just preaching what Thucydides and uh, Hermogenes or whoever some of these other th uh, folks I hear them quoting on the radio, these Greek philosophers and all these other folks, they're, they're quoting, thus saith the word of God. And the reason they are is because uh, the scriptures tell us about the scriptures uh, in Psalms 119 that the uh, testimonies of God, the judgments of God, the commandments of God, they're faithful and very faithful. Um, they're true, through and through. And uh, whenever we preach, we try to back up uh, the things that we uh, present using the Word of God. Uh, and the truth is very important. The Bible tells us in John chapter 4 that if we worship God, we must do it in truth and in spirit. And truth is a very, very important matter. Now, to the, uh, to the Pharisee, the only thing that was important was the appearance of it. Uh, they, they weren't uh, so uh, concerned with the, the truth of it as they were the letter of it. It's all right uh, if I, uh, and he lists some things here, and I don't want to get into that really, but just notice the three most important things of this law were judgment or truth, mercy, and uh, there's, not, there's not one here that doesn't like mercy. We all love mercy, and whenever we think of mercy, we want to think of uh, Psalm 136 that says that the mercy of the Lord endures forever, but I don't think that's what he had in mind, but I think what he has in mind, rather, is that we uh, have mercy one to another, uh, that we forbear one another and long-suffer one another, uh, even as the Lord our God has long-suffered and had mercy upon us. Uh, his model prayer in Matthew chapter 6, the Lord tells us, that this is how we ought to pray. Lord, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, that's a hard saying. Uh, it's hard for me. Maybe you don't have the problem uh, with forgiveness and mercy uh, uh, that I have. But, you know, sometimes I, I'm just not as quick to forgive as I know the Lord has been to, uh, to forgive me. It's hard to pray to forgive me the way that I am. Uh, we had a fellow, uh, we try to pray when we uh, have our ball games and we again practice with prayer. And uh, so sometimes we let the kids off of the prayer. And this one guy, his prayer, I'm going to say, just didn't seem that fervent to me. He uh, seemed like he was kind of joking and, 
and uh, being lighthearted about it. And he, he said, Lord, God, just help me find my shorts I can't find. And I just, oh, I was just, uh, kind of got mad, I guess, like Brother uh, Huckabee was talking about. And, uh, you know, in, in my feeble mind and the way that I am, I said, you know, if I was Lord, I'd just struck him down in the instant and he wouldn't have breathed anymore. But, you know, that's not being very charitable. And if I, if you think about that and you think about, well, if the Lord, uh, being who he is and holy like he is, looked at me, maybe he ought to snap his finger and strike me down, you see. But when he says that the way your matters are truth and mercy, you know, we can't have the both because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Truth and mercy have met together in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's why we can go to him and ask forgiveness. And we can find grace to help in time of need because he has taken away our sins. Uh, so we need to be a merciful and forgiving people, uh, especially to one another. But the last thing he says here, the way your matter matters, is faith. And uh, it's an interesting point that there's only two times that that word faith is actually mentioned in the Old Testament. There's several times it talks about faithful or faithfully, but only two times the word faith is mentioned. What in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 32 when he's talking about the folks that have no faith. Uh, over here he says that, uh, I believe the language here he says, I'm, I will hide my face from them and I will see what their end will be. What will our end be if he hides our face from, if he hides our face from us this evening? Our end will be that we've made a lot of noise, we've used a lot of breath, but we haven't accomplished anything, you see. That would be our, uh, our same end. But he said, I'm gonna hide my face from them and see what their end will be. For they are a very forward generation, children in whom is no faith. <clears throat> Well, that sounds just like what the Apostle Paul said when he said that for all men have not faith over in Thessalonians. Uh, that's just a characteristic of humanity is that all of them aren't faithful men. They're, they're not all possessors of faith. The only ones that are possessors of faith are those that are possessors of the Spirit of God uh, that he gives us in regeneration when he borns us again of the Spirit. And the other Old Testament place that talks about faith is uh, Habakkuk 2 and 4 where he says that the just shall live by faith or by his faith. Um, but but nevertheless, these are things that these Pharisees ought to be aware of. They, they knew um, uh, men of old that were faithful, like Hananiah over in uh, Nehemiah chapter 7, said that they were faithful men. Uh, and if they're faithful men, they must have been men of faith. Uh, but here are some weightier matters of the law. Right now, faith is a very important thing to us. Right now, faith is the very substance of the things we hope for. It is the, the thing that we can hang on to while we don't see that that we hope for. Uh, the, uh, Brother Huckabee talked about hope and how important it is to us. Well, faith and hope are joined together because faith is the substance of the things that we hope for, yet we see them not. Well, these are the weightier matters. And without these, I believe the rest of them can be summed up um, in Matthew chapter 15, whenever he's talking to some Pharisees over here. And he says... <clears throat> In verse 8, this people draw nigh to me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Without the way your matters, all we're doing is making it tradition and uh, making the, basically the word of God of none effect. There are things more important than how we collect money and how we distribute money and how we eat our meals, and how we keep up our grounds, there's things more important than that. And the most important thing is that we meet together with a common purpose of worship, and that we meet together with prayers, that we meet together with singing, and that we meet together with preaching, according to the, uh, the, the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here was a purging that was to be done, and Zephaniah was telling us about it over in Zephaniah chapter 3. But then verse 12 says, Verse, verse 11 says he's going to take out of it for thee those that rejoice in pride and they'll be no more haughty because of my holy mountain. Not going to be haughty and, and, and by the way he says he, I believe it's James chapter 4 in verse 8 or 10 he says humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. You know, when we're lift up on the holy mountain, we're in his presence. We, we need to be humble. And listen to what it says he'll do. He'll lift us up. 
he'll lift us up. We have a discussion about whether or not we lift up the Lord in, in our worship. How can you lift up something that's as high as it can go? Now, I know that in the scriptures there are some places that say that we need to exalt the name of the Lord, but I really don't see that his name or that, uh, that the Lord can be lifted up. We lift him up in our own sight and in the sight of others, and we want others to see him. But really lifting him up, he's as high as he gets. He's the, the pinnacle of that holy mountain uh, that we're in, and it says that he'll lift us up. And I think about Jesus whenever uh, he was asked to bless those children, and they rebuked him and said, don't bring the children, get them away, don't, don't bother the master with the children. And he says, let some of the children to come. And I, I don't know, I'll have to read to see if he did this, but I can see him lifting them up on his knees. Here's these children at his feet, and the Lord is reaching down, lifting them up on his knees and embracing them. And I see the Lord doing that to us when we're in his holy mountain and when we're humble in the state that we ought to be. Now he says that, <clears throat> he says he's going to take some things out, but then I like what he says he's going to leave in the midst. He says <clears throat> in verse 12, I'm going to leave in the midst of I will also. I'm going to do one thing, but I'm also going to do the other. And that is, leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. Now, first thing I see in that is that the Lord adds to his church daily such as should be saved. He leaves in the midst of her those that it's his desire to leave in the midst. And I think uh, for whatever reason, the Lord is, is sovereign, and uh, for whatever reason he chooses to reveal his truth in some and not in others, it's his holy will to do so. And I think there's many that seek and won't follow it because of uh, perhaps because of over, uh, overly pride, they're, they're too pride, uh, proud in the things that they have or the things that they've accomplished or the things that they're associated with. And they won't leave perhaps mom and daddy or perhaps uh, brethren. Uh, they won't leave some jobs and some, some situations to join the Old Baptist Church. I, I know some that have told me, I would be an Old Baptist, but you wouldn't have me. And I said, well, I don't know. We're pretty charitable. We, you know, I, I, don't, I can't hardly believe that the old church wouldn't have me. They said, well, I'm a mason. I said, well, now there's a little problem there. If you're going to take an oath to a potentate other than the one, only one true and holy uh, king of kings and lord of lords, the only potentate, Jesus Christ, then I have a problem with that. I said, all you got to do is leave it, uh, uh, turn it loose, leave, turn away from it, and we'll have you. He said, well, I can't do that. You see, there's something that they, they won't, they're not willing to let go of. There are some that see it and won't follow it, but there are some that just have not seen it. I believe that to be the case. I don't think the Lord shows this to every uh, elect child of God, but what a blessing to those that have seen the truth. He says, I, I will leave in the midst of thee. There, this is a very special blessing to be in the midst of so great a people in so great a city. But he says they're afflicted and poor. And I sat and I tried to think on what that means. Maybe you brethren can help me on this. But you know, they're not, we're not all poor. And I, I don't say that to myself. But I mean, there's, there's some of the Lord's uh, folks in, in the church that have a good bit of money. So they're not all poor financially. They're not all afflicted with disease or uh, all afflicted with some uh, affliction of the body. But we are all afflicted. And we're all poor. And I believe those that he's left in the midst, they're poor in spirit. They're humble and of a contrite heart. I believe we're afflicted, and I, I may, uh, may use this word wrong here, but I believe we're afflicted with the knowledge of our sins. We're afflicted with a controversy within us that when we would do good, evil is present with us. And we're constantly afflicted with our flesh. And though uh, we have to ask like the Apostle Paul, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death. We're, we're continually bombarded with that. But he also says that they that will live godly shall suffer persecution. So uh, if you want to uh, if you want to live persecution free, then you can't be in the midst of it, you say. He's going to leave in the midst of her and afflicted people. Do you know that the world, are, are, they're going to hate you, number one, because they hated Christ first. And uh, if they're all opposed to each other, they will unite in their opposition to you because they united in their opposition to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Pharisees and Sadducees did not like one another, but they united to try to get Christ, you see. The same way that the world will unite. I don't care how many religions you have, when you start talking about religion, they're going to join together and they're going to be against you. Because the truth is always going to be something the world hates. We find that, <clears throat> that Cain slew Abel. 
And he said, Wherefore slew he him? Because he, he was, his words were evil and Abel's were good. That's right. If you try to live right and righteously, you will be afflicted in this world. That's right. You will be a few days and full of troubles just to be a, a human being, but you're going to be afflicted greater if you try to live uh, in the straight and narrow way. And it is very difficult to remain when everybody opposes you. Elijah thought he was by himself, but the Lord says, I've preserved unto me 5,000. You're not by yourself. And I think the same thing is uh, true in our uh, day and time. Uh, we're not the last ones. Uh, you know, sometimes we see our church is perhaps getting small in number. The Lord's reserved unto himself uh, 5,000 or, or 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal. And the Lord's church will ever remain with us till he comes back the second time. But he says, I'm going to leave within the afflicted and poor people. Now notice their condition. He says, they shall trust in the name of the Lord. Here's going to be a remnant that looks to the Lord their God and trusts in him. And notice this. He says in verse 13, the remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity. I love that. Because Brother Huckabee is talking about that inward man. And uh, 1 John chapter 3 tells us about that inward man and says, uh, that he doth not commit sin. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin. Oh, I believe I got that wrong somehow or another. But he says, <clears throat> he cannot sin. First, I'll just read it to you. That'd be the simplest thing. In First John 3 and 9, Whoso is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Now, <clears throat> He didn't say that he wouldn't live in sin, that he might commit a sin, but he wouldn't live therein. Because, you know, that kind of teaches something the world trying to teach is perseverance, that, uh, that all of God's people will persevere, and if they sin, they're going to come back. And that's not what the Bible teaches. And that's not what that's teaching. What that's teaching is whosoever is born of God does not commit a sin, not one sin, ever. He cannot commit a sin. It says that the remnant of Israel shall do... Not, shall not do iniquity. What a blessedness to know that something within us is that holy. Right. I, I don't know. I, I hope this isn't wrong to say it's as holy as God is, but it says his seed remains in him. So it has to be as holy as God is. Right. And if Jesus Christ uh, did not sin and could not sin, then we can't sin either because his seed's within us. And this remnant that he leaves in the midst of her is in that condition. They don't speak lies. They don't have a deceitfulness in their tongue. It's not found in their mouth. For they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. You know, they, they can burst in here with guns, but if we're truly in that kingdom and feeding upon the spiritual manna from on high, what are they going to do to us? Kill us? All they're going to do is relieve us from the body of sin, and as it's already been preached, we're going to be delivered and go right into the presence of God. We're not going to be afraid of that. I, uh, you know, I, I want our nation to, to stand strong. But I, I will trust the Lord to bless his people no matter how our nation goes. May the Lord bless you. Tree of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.